millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom. Like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Hey, I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money. And today we have budget, couples and money, and life insurance listener questions. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. So I've had the listener questions kind of pile up on us lately, um, and I just looked at my inbox with questions, and there are well over 25 questions. So thank you all for those of you who have submitted questions to me. If you haven't submitted a question and you have one, just head on over to my website, shaunagame.com, and click the link, contact me, and you can go ahead and input a question there that you have that you want answered on the podcast. Occasionally, I do actually respond to the questions via email, um, especially if you know it's a, it's a particular question where you know I want to make sure that I get more information from someone before I actually am spouting out some sort of advice and guidance. Um, and again, you know when I'm asking asking when I'm answering your questions. Um, I'm doing so, you know, again with the asterisk mark, I don't know your entire situation. So I'm only looking at just a little bit of it. But um, I think questions are really good because they help all of us. It's kind of like that rule, you know, when you were in school and teachers are always like, there's no bad questions and there's no dumb questions. And I say that all the time to my students too. And I know that a lot of times they look at me like, um, but I don't want to ask that question because I think it might actually be dumb. So literally there are no bad, there are no dumb questions when it comes to money. I think this is something that everyone can really learn from one another. And there may be just even something in one of the answers that I give, or even when in one of the questions that kind of sparks something for you. So our first question is from Rob and Rob says, my fiance and I just joined bank accounts. And now we're fighting all the time about what each other is spending money on. It's really stressful and it actually scares me a bit to think it might get worse when we get married. Do you have any tips to help couples like this? Well, Rob, absolutely. You are definitely not alone. I've done a lot of podcasts over this last year about couples and money because this always seems to be a question that keeps coming to the surface. And I know how hard it is to manage money in a relationship. Um, it's just not easy, right? And some of us do better than the others. Uh, some people try to think that they're, uh, you know, keeping money separate, so they're not arguing about money. But look, the number, the two reasons why people get divorced, if you ask any therapist, number one is sex. Number two is money. Uh, Money might be number one in some situations, but those are always the two most popular reasons why people come into therapists, they get divorced, they break up, right? Because this stuff is hard. We don't like to talk about it. Let alone when you're first dating someone, the last thing you want to do is actually, you know, disclose whatever maybe dumb money moves you've made in the past. Like you kind of want to keep all of those secret hidden for as long as you possibly can. And unfortunately, like when we get engaged or when we get married, sometimes we have to let the cat out of the bag. And 
that doesn't always go as smoothly as we would like, you know? And I think, Rob, you know, one of the things that I would really suggest with for you is that, you know, you, you have to make that mental shift from individuals to partnership, no matter how you're handling your money. You know, if, if both of you don't come together and say, look, we may have different styles about how we handle money, how we think about money, but we kind of have to do this thing together. And we kind of have to have goals together. Together, and we kind of have to figure out a system that works together. What I find really often is that couples, they want to do everything separate because again, they think it's going to completely avoid money fights, but it inevitably pops up that, that you have to deal with money, right? It's really hard to avoid, especially in a marriage, some sort of money discussion because you know, you, you just have to know uh, what's going on with the other person's finances. And I really think that if you're going to get married, you know, the partnership approach is just a great way to sort of bridge that divide between two couples. Uh, one of the best things that I always recommend is have something that I call a don't ask, don't tell spending limit. And basically what that means is you and your spouse, you and your fiance, you set an amount that every month you can spend that amount without any questions. So the other person cannot give you any crap for spending that amount. But if you want to spend over that amount, you have to have a discussion with the other partner. It has to be that type of partnership relationship. And sometimes that helps you feel like, okay, whatever that number is for you as a couple, sometimes that helps you feel like you have a leeway uh, to make some decisions yourself without always having to check in. But then for the bigger stuff, you know, you got to do the, you got to do the right thing and you got to check in with your partner. And the last thing I would say again, is just get some goals together. What are you both trying to achieve financially together? And then how can you create an action plan around that so that you're both marching in the same direction? A lot of times these fights come up just because, you know, one person is a saver, one person is a spender, or, um, you know, one person does the the bank account this way, the other one does it this way. You know, there's 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 lots of those kind of underlying things, and I think it really helps when you sit down together and you figure out like what are we actually going towards then you can alleviate a lot of the arguments. You're still going to have arguments. You're still going to have frustrations. That's just human nature, right? We've got two different people with two totally separate outlooks on life, personalities, you name it, right? So it's, it's rife for conflict. But if you can come together once a week in a money date, you know, I'm talking 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes do it over something you love, like good food or a bottle of wine, um, out at the beach, out of the park, wh- whatever it is for you as a couple. But if you can come together and have just a discussion about, okay, where are we going this month? Where are we going towards our goals? You know, where are we at? Are there anything that maybe happened this week that got us frustrated? Again, that can do a lot to really help alleviate those massive fights because I don't want you to have those massive bites. Okay. Um, we got two questions from Sarah that actually came in, uh, last week that I thought were really good. Um, I wanted to put these in the mix because it kind of flows with everything we're talking about today. So first question from Sarah, she says, can you talk about budgeting for those once yearly expenses like car registration, extra state taxes, um, et cetera, all those little expenses. And that's such a great question because, you know, we, we can have a budget, we can be going in the right direction, and then some like yearly expense comes up and it just throws everything out of whack. And if you don't have an emergency fund saving, then you're turning to credit cards or, you know, just not good choices to, to pay for those expenses. So one of the best things you can do is make a list of all of those yearly expenses that you have to pay. List all of them out, right? Right. And then take those and divide them by 12 or six or however many months you have until you have to make that payment. And then incorporate that amount into your budget as a fixed expense. So you're saving for that item ahead of time. I always open a separate savings account 
to put that money in. So I know that is specially earmarked for those yearly expenses. Then when that yearly expense comes up, you're not working backwards, right? You've already got a savings pad in there to make those expenses work. And by keeping them separate from your regular savings, you're just, you're kind of giving yourself a little insurance policy that you're not tempted to dip into those because you know you want those to be there when you start saving. So again, take all of your yearly expenses, list them all out with the amount of money that you're going to need to pay in total, and then divide it up by however many months you have to save for that particular expense. Incorporate it in your budget and make sure that you're committed to that savings every month. I put all of those things on auto debit out of our account. So they automatically go to the different savings accounts. So I don't even have to think about it, which is great because I think when you have to think about it, then you have a choice, right? (laughs) Would I rather spend that hundred dollars on like a nice night out or would I rather have it go to my yearly expense fund? Well, some months, honestly, I'm going to say I'd rather go have a nice dinner out, but when it just automatically goes places, it's like I don't even have a choice, right? It's it's a weird psychology thing that happens. And again, you know, I talk about this on so many different podcasts, but really a big part of money success is just how you think, act, and feel about money. And once you can get kind of a good, um, good vibe about that, right? You can get that in, in perspective. You can figure out maybe why you make certain decisions, then you can make changes and you'll actually stick to those changes. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. 
Talkin' Money Under Podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. <laughs> I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be buried in an avalanche? weird foreign feeling of despair or how it feels to crash a skydive i remember hearing a thud feeling my body hit the ground or how you would react if you were being attacked by an alligator at the end of my leg is this huge alligator head on my leg these are the stories you'll hear on the podcast called what was that like true stories told by the actual person who went through it you'll hear from a victim of an attack dragging me into the bathroom and saying, I'm going to kill you, now you're going to die. You'll hear from a man who discovered a baby. How could this be? How could there be a baby on the ground? And you'll hear actual 911 calls. Plinky County 911, there's a man at my back door. He's trying to get in. What Was That Like is a podcast about real people in unreal situations. Search for What Was That Like on any podcast app or at whatwasthatlike.com. Okay. Another question from Sarah. This is another great one. Do you have an opinion on personal loans? We own a home and have some large pressing renovations we need to make, about $10,000. And like I said before, we don't have a flush emergency fund yet. I've gone the route through USAA before, but I'm wondering if I should shop for a good deal on a 0% interest special offer on a new credit card. This is a great question. And I think there's a couple of things to think about in this question. So number one is, you know, if you went with a 0% offer on a new credit card, how realistic is it that you could pay off that debt before the 0% offer is over? And I would say, you know, if it was like a couple thousand dollars, that's probably realistic. But something like $10,000, that's pretty unrealistic unless you just got a big cash surplus that you'll be able to pay that off in, you know, 15 or even, you know, 20 months, which are some of the longer 0% offers. And another thing is, you know, what is your credit score? So do you have a 720 plus credit score that's going to give you the 0% offers? I'm thinking you might if you're asking that question, but if, but if not, that's definitely something to think about. So one thing you could do is you could get a personal loan, understanding that yes, the interest rate is going to be higher than the 0% loans, but you could use almost like a double tactic. So you could move small chunks of that personal loan onto a 0% credit card offer and then pay it off in small chunks, manageable chunks, so that you can make sure that you're going to be able to benefit from that 0% offer and not, you know, kind of go backwards. So, you know, you, you keep paying off these little chunks and there are some credit cards that are awesome with this. Like, um, I know personally I have a discover card and I I've been really happy with discover because when I move a balance to be transferred on, a, on my discover card and I pay it off, they offer me a 0% offer all over again, right? Is it an incentive? Okay. Like, Hey, can you move more money on our card? So there are some cards that are really good for, you know, those types of repetitive offers. But again, if you have a great credit score, um, that might not be a bad idea to, to think about a, like kind of a two-tiered structure like that. That way, you're kind of benefiting from both, but you're not leaning entirely on the 0% offer and, you know, freaking yourself out that you have to pay this all off, you know, in, in a particular period of time. Because 
once you get past that 0% and you go into kind of the regular APR on that credit card, you're going to be way better off on the personal loan. So the personal loan is kind of like your, your safety net there, right? I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm a fan of personal loans. I've, you know, I've taken personal loans out myself. I know a lot of people have taken out personal loans. You know, really just want to shop around and make sure that you're getting the best interest rate that you can for your credit score. I say at least to shop, you know, two different lenders. And a lot of the lenders now you can actually uh, go online and you can you can get a rate that would be uh, for your situation without them having to do a hard pull on your credit report. So it's not actually going to pull down your credit score at all, but they're going to be able to give you a feel for what your rate is going to be. So I'd at least shop around to two different places, maybe three if possible, and, um, you know, see who's most competitive out there because a lot of these lenders, you know, they, they kind of change and, you know, one might be more competitive right now. And then in six months, another one might be more competitive. And, um, you know, so it's just important to check those out. If you've gone through USAA before and you love them, that's awesome. But at least check one other lender just to make sure that, you know, you're getting the best rate. And if not, maybe you can go to USAA and say, hey, I can get a better rate somewhere else. Are you willing to honor that rate? That happens a lot of the time. And I, I, I you know, I'm a huge fan of negotiation. Um, I think it's one of the, the best tools that we got because we at least can ask the question, what's the worst case they say? No. Okay. Then it's no big deal, right? Then we got a choice to make. But, you know, if we ask the question, um, maybe we might actually get what we want, or maybe we might actually get a better rate. You know, who knows? Okay, our last question is from Cameron. Cameron says, My company offers a bunch of benefits that I never really paid attention to. One thing they offer is life insurance, but only up to my salary. A friend of mine told me that if I leave my company, I don't get to take my insurance with me. I never really cared before, but my wife and I are thinking about starting a family, so now I'm starting to care. Can you tell me a little bit about term life insurance, and are there any options if I want a policy that isn't attached to work? Another great, great question, Cameron. These are awesome questions. Um, and yeah, you know, you, you get your benefits package at work. And I mean, for a lot of people, all you really care about is your salary <laughs> and your vacation time, right? Maybe you might care like your retirement match. Um, yeah, probably your, your health care. You're going to pick your health care. But anything else, I think a lot of times with the benefit packages, most people are like, I, I, don't, I don't even know. Like... <laughs> does it cost me money? If it costs me money, I probably don't want it. Um, and so a popular thing for companies to do is to either offer you a life insurance policy that's $50,000 or offer you one up to your salary. And your friend's correct. So if you have term life insurance through work and you leave that job, uh, your insurance does not go with you, right? It's not portable as we say. And I have been uh, working in life insurance for over 11 years now. And I can tell you um, probably eight out of 10 times, if you're paying a price for it through your company, like if you're having to pay uh, additionally on top of whatever they're covering, you're probably overpaying for that amount of coverage versus if you got the same amount of life insurance uh, outside of your company. And that shocks a lot of people, but sometimes it is a lot more expensive through your company. Like you would be shocked how much more expensive it is through your company. So term life insurance is just like it sounds. It's, it's basically renting life insurance for a specific period of time. If you got a individual policy outside of your company, it would be portable. So it doesn't matter where you work, you know, your life insurance is your life insurance. And if you have a 10-year term or 20-year term or a 30-year term, that dictates how long you'll have the insurance. Now, you can cancel at any time for an outside individual policy, but they can't cancel you. So you have control over that. And if you don't, you know, something doesn't unfortunately happen to you in that particular period of time, then, um, then you know, your term insurance expires. It's basically how it works. There are a couple of great online companies where you can search uh, individual policy rates. Haven Life Insurance and Policy Genius are awesome. I'll have links in the show notes to those. 
And one thing I like to tell you is approaching life insurance from what they call a human life value approach. Basically what that means is most people think about life insurance like this. Okay, I have a $300,000 mortgage. If I were to pass away, I would want the mortgage paid for or my child's college education or something like that. But the human life value approach talks about replacing your income for life. So your spouse and child or future child won't have to change their life dramatically, right? So for instance, if you made $75,000 a year for the next 37 years, let's say you're 30 and you want to retire at, at 67, your human life value is actually over 4 million bucks. That's how much money you stand to make between now and when you retire. That's if your salary just stays level, right? If it grows, it's even more. So what a lot of experts suggest is buying 10 times your income plus any college funds that you would want to provide for your child. And so what this would allow is your spouse to be able to invest the principal that they would get and live off the interest for a really long period of time rather than just taking that cash and paying everything off. Uh, So Cameron also asked if life insurance benefits are tax deductible. They're almost always tax deductible. Uh, There are some situations where they might not be. So you always want to make sure that you check your policy and that you really understand how it works. Um, but, But hopefully that helps clear up a little bit of the life insurance question. If your company provides it for you free, that's fantastic. You can always still purchase um, an in individual policy outside of work to supplement that. Uh, you know, again, depending on your your family situation, your personal situation, and and what's important to you. All right, so these were four awesome questions. Keep the questions coming. I'm going to keep. Um, going through questions. I'm going to try to at least do this once a month. Sometimes I forget I get in just a routine of doing the podcast. I'm like, oh yes, there are all these listener questions. Uh, So hopefully these were helpful. I thought these were, you know, four kind of big questions that we can all kind of chew on. As always, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Shauna Game. And if you love this podcast, do me a favor, shout it out on social media, share it with your friends and head on over to the link in the show notes and leave us a review in iTunes. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 